Hi, my name is Alejandro Pérez Pérez and this is the AI Coffee Podcast. Every two weeks, you will have one episode regarding one disruptive aspect of technology and AI for the time you drink a cup of coffee. Today, we have a very, very interesting guest. Her name is Ilaria. Welcome, Ilaria. How are you? Nice uh, to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very, very fine. <laughs> good, good to know. So let's present you a little bit for the audience. So Ilaria Mariani is a researcher in design-driven social technical innovation and communication systems for social change. On this topic, she lectures in the Politecnico University, uh, the Milano University. Yeah. So first question, uh, Ilaria, the first thing I would like to ask to you is if you can share with us the journey into the field of artificial intelligence and also to the field of design with a social and innovative perspective. Yes, uh, my story starts a bit far away from uh, AI and design because uh, I have a background as a game scholar where um, I was conducting research on uh, uh, games for social change. And so the social innovation part comes together with the social change part and uh, slowly uh, took me Uh, towards the public sector innovation in which I'm uh, currently very much engaged uh, with uh, uh, several European projects. Uh, and uh, um, so this, this is actually where uh, AI and design uh, um, met for uh, me. So uh, I'm actually a um, data geek as a background because I was very much interested in uh, seeing the user experience of players uh, behind uh, games. Uh, uh, but Um, I could have a chance, a great chance to move to the public sector innovation and see uh, how uh, design can embrace AI in order to create a different kind of innovation that moves from social innovation to digital uh, innovation and transformation in the public sector. So this is uh, how I come here, uh, bringing, let's say, a very populated background uh, full of game studies, communication design, interaction design, um, service design and a bit of surrounding topics and um, neighboring uh, uh, knowledge coming from uh, the sociological field, for example. It sounds really interesting. Um, well, you were also my teacher in the AA for Gov Masters, so one of those at least. And your story is really inspiring because uh, you are not only thinking about AI like a technology at all, you are thinking about a way to change the, the society, which I think it's really huge and really, really impressive. So, well, maybe you have already said a couple of words about that, but can you maybe say more about what inspired you to specialize in design-driven social technical innovation and communication systems? Well, uh, a key pillar for me was uh, the interest in having an impact. Um, that started actually with uh, bringing an impact on, on uh, individuals. So with Games for Social Change, uh, how to um, introduce a change to, from um, interacting with games on very also hard and harsh uh, topics. Uh, but later on, especially with uh, EU projects I've been involved in, I could move Uh, a bit uh, uh, the scale towards the communities and even society more at growth, so to enlarge the kind of uh, impact to bring. So I will say that uh, what inspired me was to uh, make um, um, a better future together. Uh, and you were correctly saying that uh, um, my perspective is that of a person um, who is going beyond technology, because for me, the human being is always in, uh, at the very, very center and core of everything. And so uh, the inspiration is a mix and match of this, uh, human beings, uh, society, community, and how uh, together we can build a better future and uh, have better experiences in our life, especially in public services. <laughs> This is always a very key topic. Yeah, I, I can understand. And nowadays that all public administration are working with AI or trying to work with AI. Um, 
it's it feels really hard, right? I mean, can you share more your I mean your in your ideas about this because usually it's really hard to to mix all of these points, but really important work at least, but really hard. So yeah, how it works, how how it is. Well, a uh, fundamental premise is that public administrations are more and more interested in having design-driven innovation, putting the human being at the center. They uh, um, also, with the push uh, of the European Commission, um, there is uh, more attention into um, making better services uh, and making these services able to answer real needs. So let's say that it's hard, but uh, we have a great collaboration and great support in this and a growing interest uh, in, uh, in this direction. And uh, on the other side, there is this uh, increasing uh, presence of emerging technologies and AI, which cannot be neglected. It's here and it's more and more in uh, every moment of our daily life. And so uh, let, let's say that it come quite uh, uh, natural actually to, get, to be engaged in more and more projects about it. And um, let's say it um, build upon uh, the concept uh, that uh, no one size be all and that public administrations especially are realizing the, uh, that uh, services um, needs to keep into consideration the different needs of people um, without like uh, an average human being but uh, considering the diversities of those who are engaged so being inclusive and uh, um, accessible for a very uh, and growingly extending um, population community of users yes you you also i remember i mean you by the lessons we we had together you also explain us how important design is and for a technical person as me for example it was really important because i was just i was really used to create things but like and also maybe thinking a little bit about the needs and so on but having a um, technical path like to to detect the needs to to go for the goals to i mean what to build how to build it how to measure everything i think it's really important and and also, it creates a lot of value at, at the end point. And I think that's the, the most important part, right? So not to create things because we want to create things. Create things because there is a final goal and human is always at the end. Yeah, that's really important. If I may add to this, uh, indeed, uh, we always uh, and very much speak about value-driven innovation. So the value is at the core um, because uh, real needs should be the trigger uh, of innovation. And uh, innovation should always look at uh, uh, meeting the expectation, the needs of people, and so uh, to give a real answer to real challenges. And uh, so, as you were uh, greatly saying uh, just a few minutes ago, um, to build upon what uh, we need, we perceive as something uh, uh, that is relevant for us. But uh, I would just stress that sometimes this needs. Uh, uh, are not very well known. They may be a little bit latent and uh, undetectable. And so uh, our um, our work as researchers and designers is to actually dig into that. And uh, you were pointing out that uh, um, there is a process to do that. So we use design thinking uh, as a way to dig into the real needs, get make them surface, turn them into insights, and then build good solutions upon, upon them. You know, I, I have been talking about design a little bit with my friends and so on because of all we learned. And I, for example, I have this example to show everyone how it works and how important it is. And it is uh, maybe it's worldwide. There is uh, in the parks, there are usually paths uh, made, but usually these paths doesn't that, that don't fit to the, the 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 way people walk and usually they, they are like alternative paths made by people walking and that shows how important design is because people are really asking for other things they are really asking for other paths or other ways to achieve uh the goal right to go one from one side to the other side of the park uh but the the parks are built differently so even though they are in i mean uh, out of AI and technological and digital spaces, design is also very important and it's everywhere. So yeah, what important thing? Yeah. 
Mm. So, Ilaria, uh, we have been talking a lot about design, uh, but uh, maybe can you can you explain what design is in your words? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a really tough question. Uh, design, uh, coming from the uh, Department of Design, we look at design as a way to uh, build a new product service systems by uh, indeed uh, um, identifying uh, real crucial challenges that we detect and trying to answer them uh, uh, in the best way possible considering the multiple opportunities which we have. But uh, I would say that at the core there is again this uh, turning challenges into opportunities and uh, building uh, solutions whichever they are, so ranging from the product to the service system scale, um, there is this um, idea of going iteratively, uh, so there is no uh, right solution on the spot to be uh, put in place, but there is a um, continuous cycle, set, series of cycles of iteration that allows us uh, to um, verify, to uh, envision, ideate, design, prototype, test, and come back. So we keep looping in this, like uh, sometimes a little guinea pigs, uh, but because we need uh, to experiment and to have our hands dirty uh, and uh, have this hands-on first-hand experience of things, uh, which allows us to see how things are working in reality and see how they are actually going to m meet the expectation uh, uh, that uh, we, uh, we should meet indeed an answer to. Yes, I... I think I remember as all the students you have um, the word frame and reframe, and <laughs> and I think it's really important, right, to to create this iterative process from making something that it's maybe not the best thing, but already something, and then testing, seeing how it works, how it goes to the needs, and then reframe what we were thinking everything was and then redo and so on and then maybe by this uh iterative process maybe with after some inter 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 interactions we arrive to the to the final point that we want to achieve yeah so can you explain something i mean what well, frame and reframe is and, and yeah why we are all a little bit obsessed with this now, actually, uh, a former colleague of yours from the AI for Gov project said that I've been his nightmare uh, asking to frame and reframe because the way in which uh, the problem was understood was not actually uh, well framed, as to say, consider um, defined, uh, considering the context uh, uh, at broad in which it was uh, operating uh, and um, considering the entire ecosystem of factors, the dynamics uh, in place over there, the framework uh, from the like policy framework, political, culture, social, uh, historical value, everything has to be considered, has to be taken into uh, account when seeing that's the context in which we operate. And that's the first part, because from this, then you start saying, but then what's the real problem you're speaking about? Is it the real problem? Or is it just one of the surface that we see? And this is why we have to dig progressively more and more, as to say, get in touch with those who are expert in their needs, people, and get to know uh, what they uh, go through when experiencing uh, something. And so uh, being able to detect pain points, uh, barriers, obstacles, and in this way, uh, you've got to reframe the problem by identifying uh, very crucial and fundamental elements uh, uh, like um, the expected impact of a solution, uh, the real pinpoints which are here and there, who is the target, but uh, not just in a broad way, but in a very specific manner, and the different targets uh, which may be addressed uh, by the solution you are designing. And then who are the other players? Because the uh, solutions are not in a vacuum. They are, again, in a context with a lot of people, uh, entities and organizations which are uh, with, uh, operating over there and have interplays and power dynamics in place that oh, we all need to consider. And I also bring um, the technology in, uh, in this because it's uh, another big player to keep uh, in, in the loop again. Hmm. Um, sorry for this colleague uh, where you were his uh, nightmare. 
Um, but what I think, I think it's a process also to learn and, and it's really, really interesting. And I apply this even at my workplace. So, I mean, it's, it's really practical. So thank you for uh, being so, um, enthusiastic with us, uh, uh, knowing this and, uh, and teaching this. But yeah. if, if I can add on, I've been a nightmare, but at the end of the day, um, he, uh, when uh, this colleague of ours was making an inspirational pitch describing uh, what happened so far, the nightmare became the biggest learning that he got uh, as um, getting to understand uh, uh, why his actually technical background was making him uh, frame the problem in a certain way and including the design perspective that we were bringing helped him in seeing things in a different manner, really created that made a difference. So I have to say that I may have been a nightmare and a pain in the ass at the beginning, but in the long run, uh, we all grew together. And this is something I would like to stress that uh, uh, I'm also always growing because, you know, you never stop learning and becoming a, a more knowledge portion about what happens around. And so never stop. Hi, it's Alejandro Perez Perez, host of the Ecofi podcast, and I have a very short message to you. Sorry for this interruption. Please, as this is an independent project, it will be really, really important for me if you could subscribe to the podcast. You could also share with your friends and relatives. And please, a very important thing is to subscribe to the Air Coffee newsletter at alejandroperezperez.substack.com. It will make this project bigger and bigger. And of course, it will create more valuable interviews for you. Thank you very much. And let's continue the podcast. I agree with you that if something makes you feel maybe that all your context is breaking is because you you are learning a new context and you are growing also so yes it's really important also to to face these new challenges and to 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 learn yeah of course that's the only way we learn actually so uh we were talking about design like uh, the whole concept which is really broad but let's focus a little bit on, on your, your specific domain, which is uh, design-driven social and technical innovation. So uh, can you explain us why this domain is so important nowadays? Uh, well, uh, as said, uh, we have a growing number of emerging technology and also persuasive artifacts uh, which are surrounding us. And uh, we cannot uh, uh, just not consider them but we need uh, actually to make it to advance research on it and include them uh, in uh, our daily life uh, in a uh, better and better way uh, le let's say that uh, mm, social technical uh, are two terms uh, which often a, a bit uh, um, you know, it's not collapse, uh, it's not collide, but it's uh, like uh, have a friction sometimes because uh, you need to put uh, society and technology together and looking at the best way uh, to integrate and intertwine the two things. And the way in which uh, uh, the potentiality that is, it has, it's uh, huge uh, and it also requires some kind of effort to get there. But uh, uh, one of the way in which uh, we've been approaching that is that uh, of um, engaging people uh, in doing that, as to say, uh, not just having the designers designing, but engaging the people, the stakeholders, the ecosystem abroad in, uh, in that. So to uh, mix together a sort of bottom up and top down approach so that needs a face, but not just that, but uh, in uh, more and more uh, co-creation and co-design uh, uh, way of um, building upon uh, the knowledge that is inside people. So this is uh, a great way um, to make technology more uh, societal oriented by including society in uh, the process uh, in multiple ways. And by society, I mean uh, not just universities and research centers and uh, the technological players, uh, but also um, people like civic. Uh, civil society in it, uh, and the different kind of users who are affected. So this is how we do it. Mm, really interesting. But Ilaria, you mentioned two words that are really important. Uh, you mentioned co-creation and co-ideation uh, or something like that. Co-design. Co-design, sorry. Um, can you uh, say what it is to the audience? 
yeah, my pleasure and apologies for not saying that uh, in advance because we tend to give for granted our vocabulary and this is uh, a problem. Um, well, co-creation uh, is about co-creating ideas uh, together while uh, co-design means uh, uh, participating in the act of designing them. So uh, participating in uh, not just the conceiving um, an idea of a possible solution, but also um, participating in the prototyping part in the real uh, designing of, uh, of it. And so this is much different from um, something that uh, is uh, very much established and it's uh, including people when it comes to the testing phase, like for a validation uh, of a possible solution, but co-creation and co-design brings people in uh, since the very beginnings of the early stages so that we can um, progress together and uh, uh, keep that need so that we keep speaking about very much uh, integrated. And um, in so doing, we also embrace something that may seem a bit scary, that is ambiguity, uh, so that ambiguity becomes a, a trigger and uh, um, constant inspiration so that uh, when we face ambiguity and we face uh, difficulties, uh, uh, we actually uh, are pushed to innovate more and more. And so embrace ambiguity rather than being scared and include it. So we love like opening up possibilities and never say, no, it doesn't work, but yes, let's see and keep going uh, and envisioning possibilities, even if uh, they may seem not feasible at all. But at the end of the day, you never know. And so let's build up together uh, and, and see what we can bring out of it with a lot of creativity. For me, it's completely, I mean, it makes a lot completely a sense if you are designing something for one specific group, it makes a lot of sense to ask this group to interact with you and co-design it. I mean, uh, maybe for me, the thing that could be difficult is how to create these collaborations and this co-design. But actually, uh, the idea itself, it's, it's completely, I mean, I don't understand why people don't do like that, actually, to be honest. Because it's so, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I mean, even if you are, I mean, you are creating something for making money, if you don't count with the people that are supposed to, to buy it or to, to, to use it, it's, I mean, you are not going to be so much used or bought. I mean, it's completely like that because uh, you forget actually uh, why you make everything. And it's because someone is behind using this or, um, I mean, whatever. So it makes a lot of, of sense. Yeah. Yeah, but it requires a very specific mindset, that is that of being open to include users and stakeholders when you design. And it's, uh, it, it, it also implies quite an effort because uh, the process slows down a lot, but in the long run, it fades back uh, a lot more, as to say um, that uh, beyond iterations, uh, iterations that we were speaking about before, Having um, users at the center means uh, uh, spending time in user research, but also engaging like people in uh, um, interactive workshops, uh, in moments in which you bring them uh, around the table, uh, physical or virtual, and you speak it uh, out and you see what emerges from that. Uh, from our point of view as researchers and designers, uh, you have to come in with uh, some uh, hypotheses and some like um, lines of investigation that uh, you want to know more, but then uh, it doesn't mean you have to stay stuck on that because most of the time the discourse sparkles in different direction and that where it is where it comes, uh, the innovation, real innovation. But when you bring it uh, into established uh, organizations which have a pipeline of, of uh, development, uh, it implies uh, a lot of flex flexibility, but also change of an existing and maybe established uh, uh, mindset that is that of revising the way in which they operate. So um, from a, a point of view of ideal uh, process uh, that's easy to be said but mo much more difficult to be done because it requires effort resources and uh, in terms of uh, time energy and, and uh, also money because it comes it comes together hmm. i understand it but i mean 
I would like to also to know from you if you have uh, participated in one relevant example that you can show us also to to learn together how it works in practical because you said that practical is the hard point so maybe with that we can learn better well um i am very lucky i'm a very lucky human being because um i've been engaged in a lot of projects uh, which uh, have the so-called pilots and pilots are real life experimentations so from cisco to easy rides uh, um, and now Orbis, uh, which is another project, uh, ju just to make some names uh, um, without comporter, actually. Um, we create this uh, uh, small scale experimentation in which we engage living labs of reality on the territory uh, and uh, build ecosystems of actors around them. So to engage people um, with a, a core organization uh, and then uh, increased amount uh, of uh, of uh, people, stakeholders, actors uh, uh, involved in the process. For example, um, in easy rights uh, that uh, um, aimed um, um, at building better services to ease the integration of, of uh, migrants by uh, facilitating their access to um, public services. That is quite a challenge. What uh, what we did was to build. Uh, um, different ecosystems. Um, we had four different pilots, uh, Palermo, Larissa, Birmingham, and Malaga. And uh, we went through uh, different cycles of uh, development of public services by um, starting from challenges from very, very, very much territory, and then engaging public administrations who cooperated with uh, local NGOs, uh, with uh, researchers and designers uh, uh, cooperating with them to support the process and then technological partners who were supporting in the development of the solution. Plus, we made also these um, hackathons in order to open up the challenges that we were identifying to bring uh, people in from the context and then design together um, better solutions, which were uh, very much uh, growing uh, from uh, uh, the context in which we were situated and these ecosystems uh, sometimes become very very big other times they were a bit smaller uh, elsewhere they become bigger but in this in these terms uh, i will just stress out that we were uh, able to engage migrants and uh, in it so that we could really understand uh, how painful it was to go through certain processes and services and understand where they were in need of support and what we could do to improve it. And so we designed uh, uh, three services uh, within the project plus eight services uh, across the pilots. So it was really like uh, uh, um, an inspiring, uh, sparkling, um, context and fertile playground in which there's very much interaction between different kind of uh, of actors called uh, uh, bring innovation in it is amazing uh, the job you were doing because um, i cannot even imagine how difficult it could be for a migrant to to access to public services because even for people living in the country uh, it's hard to usually to i mean i don't know in spain for example we have a like something to for the public administration the electronic uh, things to sign all the documents and and all of this thing is usually a mess even for us so i cannot even imagine for a person that doesn't know maybe spanish correctly or even um i mean what a, one ministry uh, specific is or works like maybe we should know at least but it's it's amazing what you were doing but how did you engage the migrants because um, that's hard right well let's say that in, in easy right we had a very nice set of challenges first of all uh, migrants were speaking a lot of different languages that we didn't speak and uh, one uh, the, the problems that uh, were there was the uh, um, difficulty to understand uh, the bureaucratic process, but also the bureaucratic language spoken and used within uh, uh, services. So uh, the way in which we engaged them was relying uh, on the territory and on the context in which um, uh, we um, 
identify partners that have been engaged in the, pro in the project and uh, like NG on NGOs uh, and uh, uh, local ones uh, um, that could support us uh, because they had already a network of uh, migrants uh, to rely uh, that could uh, support us and uh, it allows us to enter the process uh, of them experiencing uh, the public services actually by going there and following them like uh, sometimes uh, really like participant observation looking at how the process was experienced uh, in place uh, what was a real situation so uh, looking at migrant uh, at a migrant uh, trying to express him, sir, himself himself uh, herself themselves uh, and uh, see where the friction was where the pain points were and so the critical moments in which we could uh, intervene and improve ease the, the process itself so we had uh, the great opportunity and uh, to engage people on the territory who could support us in speaking with uh, uh, them using different languages and uh, the, the partners were actually great uh, but the ecosystem at Broad was uh, uh, the very key to uh, to go through that. Would you say that um, this part, this engagement, is one of the most common barriers and talents in by creating this uh, work with ecosystem with different actors, or would you say that there are another kinds really relevant? Well, uh, the engagement for sure is uh, a thing, but uh, it, it's not the only one. The, the design thinking uh, uh, itself has its own uh, challenges. Uh, but uh, when when you decide to go for co-creation and co-design, and so you have this engagement of third parties and users, uh, well, uh, there uh, is where you have to start speaking the same language, for example, uh, get to know each other, understanding uh, um, the potentiality of each, uh, uh, but also the limits uh, that we all have. Speaking about public administration, uh, um, we have to understand that there are security issues to keep into, into account, there are uh, policy framework to consider, uh, there are um, a, a lot of technical issues, for example, uh, that cannot be neglected. And so all these elements uh, uh, come, come together. So uh, the engagement uh, uh, who also called for the technological partners who were engaged within that so that everybody could have first-hand understanding and get very much uh, on the same page to see, okay, this is the problem, this is what happens, let's see how together we can, we can address it, bringing our own expertise and uh, like a Twitter thing, uh, uh, putting them together for the best. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you mentioned a little bit, but what about the opportunities of, of working uh, between ecosystems? Because, well, actually, maybe you, if you could say a couple of words about what an ecosystem is, maybe also for, for like everyone understand, but if we are talking about an ecosystem of different actors, such as the NGOs, such as migrants in this case, or users or people or citizens or whatever, but also, uh, I don't know, companies, coders, uh, I mean, uh, what exactly an ecosystem is. is, yeah, exactly. And why is so important and what opportunities are there? Uh, well, uh, we call, uh, um, it's a term that we borrow from the innovation studies where there is this idea of innovation ecosystems, which are um, uh, the settings, the spots in which the innovation can grow. And it's called ecosystem because it's, kind of uh, an ecological system that comes again from um, the uh, it's a, um, a borrowed term from the ecology and uh, uh, it was um, related to the interaction of animals within a setting it's not so different it's uh, the interaction the interplay of different actors uh, within uh, a setting a context uh, and how uh, what happens there uh, how they do relate, uh, uh, which are the powers in place, but also uh, which are the dependencies uh, which um, are uh, operating over there. 
and so we um, we, we moved towards uh, the idea of this ecosystem uh, co-creation ecosystems as niches uh, as uh, spots where the innovation could grow because uh, there's multiple actors uh, could operate together and cooperate uh, not just by conceiving ideas, but then co-designing and co-developing, co-producing and testing them uh, together. And it was the very presence uh, of these uh, different people doing things uh, together that helps uh, the ecosystem to bring uh, uh, an innovation in place. But uh, to, to come back to your example, sorry, about it. The innovation ecosystem may have like migrants, NGOs, the academy, um, as an ease, small media enterprises and startups, um, civil society like uh, uh, citizens or migrants are also in that case, uh, public sector administration. So um, the municipalities who are in the loop and then uh, um, other stakeholders uh, uh, which uh, uh, were considered relevant in in, um, in the specific setting. But there is, again, uh, it, it's difficult to say how it's composed because it's, it depends on the solution and the challenge, the challenge that you get and the solution uh, you want to make because according to this, uh, you reach out to different uh, players. Hmm. I, I remember when we were thinking about uh, actors in the ecosystem or stakeholders um, that we usually were working with a big, big uh, paper. Um, we were like thinking, what are the most, the most relevant ones and the ones that are affected the most uh, by uh, our actions? Impacted. So exactly impacted and affected and or something like that. And yes, I mean, there's like, I mean, infinity kinds of uh, actors usually in the ecosystem, but um, there are some that are more relevant. Um, yeah. Can you say, for example, in this example, uh, how to choose uh, who are the most relevant ones and, and, and why? Uh, it's not a matter of choosing. They are already there. It's a matter of engaging them. Um, before, however, it's relevant uh, and necessary to map the, the people, the entities uh, that uh, are playing a role within that. And um, you do that, uh, as you were saying, by um, we use a matrix uh, for doing it. It's a very um, practical way of doing that is understanding who is uh, in most impacted by the solution and influenced by that. Uh, so that you can see uh, which are your direct stakeholders who uh, that you should bring in no matter what, <laughs> and then the more uh, ind indirect one. And then according to this population of stakeholders, which may be um, municipalities, but also uh, technical providers, um, uh, reception cent center workers, uh, in the case of migrants and so on, uh, or employment centers, it depends really from uh, where you are acting and the solution you are developing. Um, we also uh, use um, a stakeholder engagement map uh, that helps, uh, helps us uh, mapping down who should be engaged uh, and at which level, as to say, uh, from the level that is the most known as informed by what's happening to be consulted in order to develop, uh, um, conceive an idea or develop that to a more um, profound and in-depth level of engagement that are that of co-creating the idea or co-designing the solution by putting your hands on that and then even uh, co-producing it uh, and participating in very, very production. An example about it uh, uh, comes from the living labs and the um, maker spaces, for example, which are like, um, uh, the um, core or uh, ecosystems when uh, they are in place because they tend to be the, the spot where the magic happens because uh, uh, are like um, uh, playgrounds uh, uh, full of possibilities of people who are willing to, you know, put themselves uh, um, um, in play and uh, uh, try to uh, experiment new things. So this this uh, part of the experimentation being prone and desire have this desire um, to try out something uh, uh, um, um, 
an engine, a very powerful transformative force uh, that uh, moves uh, things uh, ahead. Really, really interesting, uh, Ilaria. We are finishing. I have a couple of questions left um, before you go. So uh, one of the last questions I usually ask to everyone coming to this podcast is if you could give an inspirational message to someone that maybe wants to, to, to learn about design, about social technical design as you, uh, related to AI, what would you say to these people? Well, um, never be scared of something you don't know. Not knowing something means you have a lot of room for uh, learning and improving. And the way in which we learn is by doing. So find the right spot where to put yourself in and put yourself uh, uh, into that uh, without being scared, but trying to uh, understand how can you contribute to what is the thing you can bring in, uh, what you're good at and how can you support and so being proactive in uh, in this. And there is uh, no wrong choice. There is no uh, no when designing, but there there is, uh, especially when you are envisioning a lot of yes and and yes and, so to build upon each other and never let anybody down or out of the game for biases or prejudice. That's uh, what, what I would say. And keep trying because we need to fail fail more, fail better, so that we can uh, de design better solutions. Mm. And I would add, fail fast. That's also yeah, a good one thing. I mean, uh, because only by creating things, even if it doesn't work, we learn maybe that that's not the way. So yeah. so the sooner the better. But thank you very much for this message, Ilaria. One last question is, how may the audience contact you if they want to? And also, uh, well, I, I made the two questions together. Uh, you are an Italian person, so you might like coffee. You know uh, the name of the of, of this podcast is the AI Coffee Podcast. So how do you like coffee? I'm sorry. I'm uh, a very weird Italian, but I go for American coffee. Wow. <laughs> I know. That's a surprise. Uh, but uh, I, I'm a bit... Uh, a uh, weird person. Uh, let's say that I go for American coffee with Italian coffee that I grind in the morning and I make my uh, American coffee and I also have a machine here uh, so that I can uh, have a long coffee that lasts during the day so that it's a constant pleasure that comes with me. And regarding how to contact me, uh, well, my page is on the Department of Design of Politecnico di Milano, but you can find me on um, Google Scholar, you can find whatever I wrote, uh, it's all there. And then on social media, uh, under the name No Distance to Run, that very much reflect uh, my way of approaching, as I say, no, there is nothing else we can do, but let's do the same. Let's try again and keep going. So this is how you can find me. Amazing. I will add all the, the website, all the links as part of the description to the podcast so you can go there and, and see everything. So thank you, Ilaria. We have finished. It has been a pleasure having you here. I think we have learned so much from design and I was really comfortable. I, so I think also you, right? So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you also to you for being here one more my episode. If you liked it, please subscribe to the podcast. It's only one second for you and it creates a lot of value for me. Also, share it with your friends, your relatives, your colleagues. And also, uh, if you like it, please rate five stars or press the like button if you're on YouTube. Thank you very much. See you soon. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>